So, um, hello everybody to our Life with the Author episode three, and I'm very happy to uh, welcome uh, Mark Hürzler from uh, Munich to this uh, third episode talking about clinical failures, shortfalls of immediate implant procedures. But uh, let me make a short introduction. Uh, Mark, we know each other for 35 years now. So maybe some people were not, was not even born uh, looking at uh, the video <laughs> when we <laughs> first met. And I, and I remember, and I remember that, uh, that you, uh, uh, were, you, you have been an assistant at the conservative department. At that time, the CEREC system uh, was invented and I was one of the first patients treated by you uh, in two sessions of eight hours. I remember eight hour rubber dam on my face. And uh, I have to tell you the five inlays you did with the prototype are still in my mouth. So they really? were 34 years old. And I tell people always, this is operator sensitivity. Thank so you. the material was shit. The material we used, it was all experimental. I remember I have five different materials, five different cement protocols, whatever. You, you took out of the drawer what was there and put it in my mouth. But uh, it's still there because you took the time and tried to do the best at that time. And I think this is uh, not only important for conservative dentistry, but especially important for, for what we are now talking about, surgical treatments, especially implant treatment that has become uh, in all these 35 years has gone a long way. And you started uh, with a very interesting article in the journal back in 2006. And I remember uh, this article very well because your group was very honest and very open to discuss failures. And because at that time, nobody had failure. Everybody was placing implant and had 100% success and uh, was uh, dealing with, uh, and we, we saw only these images of the, of the finished cases and no post-op post pictures, follow-up of six months maximum, not, not, not talking about years. And you were brave enough to show uh, to share cases like this with uh, where you have like I say we will talk about this uh, later in the discussion a little bit overdone with implant placement and uh, what I really like is then what we, what you have shown how it looks later when some things did not happen as expected so um I welcome you, Mark. Uh, you are also the president of the European Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. Unfortunately, we missed the this year meeting in Fushul, but we will uh, see each other next year. And I hope also uh, many, many of the people now watching us, uh, many are European Academy members, but the group, the Facebook group has grown. We are now four and a half thousand members already in a very short time and it's growing. So I think aesthetic dentistry and what uh, the European Academy and what the journal is doing is of great interest. So let's start with the first question that I ask everybody. So if you had to rewrite the article, what would you change? Okay, thanks first, uh, Alessandro, to give me the opportunity to speak with you about uh, this article and also for the invitation to be with you here and uh, discuss this topic, which is a hot topic still today, and it will all over the world, I would say. When you ask me, would I write it the same way? I mean, writing and clinical doing is a big difference. Uh, when I look at the concept we had at that time, my partner Otto and myself, we strongly believed at that time that teeth uh, implants are better than teeth. And that's why I would never do this clinical approach anymore today, what we did at that time. But our thinking was at that time, as I said, implants are better than teeth. And so if you have the thought process, now it comes to the other thinking, what about placing immediate implant into extraction socket? Would you do this today? Maybe in another way, but I would still do immediate implant placement today. But uh, first we placed way out too many implants, no doubt. But I can explain you a little bit why we did this at that time. 
you know, all on four is very popular today. And in every mouth, and when you go on Congress, on implant Congress, it's all on four, that's it. When you look at this case, we started in 1995, 996, as one of the first group in the world with upper jaw immediate implant placement and immediate loading of those cases. They were really immediate loaded because when there is no more teeth, you have to do an immediate loading. And since we didn't believe so strong in implants at that time, we placed more implants. We placed, when you look at the case, you can see that we placed <clears throat> so many implants, 10, 11 implants was our thought process. And the most stable implants, namely in this case, four implants, this is my dog, <laughs> the four implants, which were most stable, we immediate loaded. And this, when Marlowe's concept became popular, we said, this is going to work. This is not a problem because we did this all the time. And we find out that most of the time, all of the four implants we immediately loaded survived. And then we had at the end, as you see also in this case, too many implants there because we thought we'd lose some and then we still have five, six left over and then we can do the final restoration on this five, six. This was our thought process. But today we know we would never play so many implants. The question is, what about immediate or delayed? This is a topic, I mean, on one side we have the aesthetic, on the other side we have the function. And uh, there is a lot of litter today that we can place implants immediately in extraction socket, very successful, very successful regarding the function. Aesthetics, maybe it's a bigger problem because we get aesthetics compromised situation over the years. At the moment, there was just last year, at the end of last year, a new publication from a Spanish group, Canales. They compared immediate with, immediate with delayed in the aesthetic zone. And actually, their conclusion is that there was no difference. But as we just discussed before, the, before we started this, uh, webinar or this discussion, it's very technically sensitive. I mean, if somebody's used to do delayed, it may be better to do things delayed. If somebody is very much used to immediate, he may get the better result with immediate. So it's also technique sensitive. Who knows which technique better? I remember how I was influenced by this article, for instance, we completely changed our concept and we went completely to delayed. And today I must say, as always, the truth is somewhere in the middle. You know, today we don't say we do nothing anymore immediate. We do more and more immediate again. We see the advantages and disadvantage of both techniques, immediate and delayed, but uh, it depends on your experience you have with the different options. Now we are lucky we have a lot of experience in both approaches and we understand both approaches on a very high level and we know all the advantages and disadvantages of both approaches very well. And so we decide together with the patient what would be the best in his case. That's more or less the approach we go. So this uh, leads to the next question. Uh, are immediate implants predictable? So you, maybe you answer, or you already answered uh, oh, this question. It, it's pretty clear. I mean, looking at the literature, it is very, very predictable. I mean, the drawback is it's technically more difficult to get enough primary stability. Specifically, when you go to the molar area, it becomes even more demanding. But there are different techniques available today to achieve this also in the molar area. So the recommendation, the literature today is pretty clear when it comes to immediate implant placement. The study by Lang and Sanz clearly came up with the conclusion you should start with premolar area. This is the most easiest one. You get easier primary stability. You have not such a drawback when you have a little bit of a recession in this area. So the premolar area is the most easy area to do immediate implant placement. But on the other side, if you are experienced, you can do it everywhere today, and it's very predictable. But it's technically not so simple, no doubt. 
So this uh, maybe this is also something related to this uh, question. What aspects do you take into consideration? So uh, hard and soft tissue. So um, maybe this hard question tissue. is related to gingiva type and bone quality. First, you have to differentiate between functional and aesthetic zone. In the aesthetic zone, it's not only a success when the implant is also integrated, it's only a success when it looks aesthetically also great, then you can speak about the success. In the functional area, if you lose one or two millimeter soft tissue, it's, and the implant is completely integrated in bone, it's still a wonderful success. So in the posterior area, it is uh, easier regarding the outcome, predictability, to place an implant there and immediately in the extraction socket. In the aesthetic zone, all the thought process you just mentioned, like uh, phenotype, gingiva type, the bone quality has to do with the primary stability. If the bone quality is lower, then you have more problems to create a good primary stability. And then you may have to decide to do immediate implant placement with only an open healing without an immediate promisation. This happens today very often. So the moment you go immediate, it is uh, always a question also about the bone quality. If you are able to do that, yes or no. So it depends, you know, also on the hardware you use. This is another issue. All the implant systems ask for different torques, insertion torque, final torque, and all these things. You have to understand your hardware you use as a clinician very well. So sometimes people ask me, when do you do an immediate provisation on an implant aesthetic zone? I cannot give the answer. It depends on the hardware. Looking at the different implant systems, some of them need 60, 70 Newton centimeter insertion torque to do an immediate provisation. Some of them 20 to 30 is enough. So there you cannot give really a perfect recommendation. This is very, very dangerous. Some people stay on the stage and say you need 40 to 50 Newton centimeter, then you can do an immediate provisation. I doubt this because this depends a lot on the hardware. But you have to be more critical, there's no doubt, in the aesthetic zone. There you have with a thin biotype, you can expect more resorption. You know, it depends according to the literature, also about the thickness of the buccal bone, about the thickness of the tissue, the recession, the tendency of recession is in a thin biotype and in a thin buccal bone, higher the tendency there to achieve, unfortunately, a recession on those implants, and this makes it more critical. So yes, it has an influence on your decision, or you have some other options. There are always options, you know, that you can overcome these problems. And this is, again, you see this when you compare people who are used to do it delayed, then they recommend you to do it all the time delayed, only 3 5% immediate. Like, specifically, like you in Switzerland, Danny Booser, they are on delayed, delayed, delayed. And then you speak with Joe Kahn, Loma Linde, he is the opposite. He's 3 5% delayed and 95% immediately. Mm -hmm. So there are so many ways to come to Rome. And at the end, it depends a lot about you as clinician. What is your experience? What can you do with your own hands, with your skillness? Possible are many ways, but you just have to understand the drawbacks. That's the important thing about what we just discussed now. Like, there are many issues you have to take into consideration when you place an implant in the aesthetic zone, immediate. Delayed can also end up with a disaster. Don't misunderstand me. The more, re the more surgical procedure you perform, the more scar tissue, calloid you can create, and this creates also not a perfect aesthetic outcome. The more difficult it is to create papilla between implant and the neighboring tooth. So there are many issues also involved with a delayed approach. So some people are very well in doing that. Some people can do it in the immediate approach.
What are you recommending young dentists starting to uh, explore these things? Because I see that uh, uh, there's a lot of implant workshops, uh, education, whatever. They tell you, I, I remember 30 years ago, you had to go for two weeks to Sweden and, and then they came from Sweden uh, from Noble BioCare to assist you for the first 10 implants to check that everything was done according to their protocol. And today, in a two-hour workshop, you learn how to place an implant. So what, what, uh, what are your recommendations for, for younger dentists when they, when they say or when they are fascinated about uh, placing implants? Where, where should they start? Should they uh, take a lot of courses or go? Because you told me there's the group of delayed implants, there's the group of uh, more immediate implants. So where would you start? First of all, I think what we should do is going back to the roots, as it's very, uh, this is important. I mean, if you want to become, in my opinion, if you want to become a good implantologist, you must understand periodontology. And that's what I meant when I say you must go back to the roots. You should understand better how periodontal surgery works, how you can maintain teeth, and this is the first approach you should take to understand to do surgery on teeth. This gives you a lot of a lot of knowledge to transfer this knowledge. You cannot completely just take it and transfer it to implant dentistry, but you understand the biology better. That's what I always teach. In our academy we always teach you need to understand the biology. You must be a biological thinking surgeon. That's the only thing. You should never do and that's something we always teach. You should never do an incision at this site or at this spot because I say it, or my partner, Dr. Sewer, say, you have to do the incision there. You should never do that. You should only do the incision and the angulation of your blade and everything because you understand biology behind it. If you don't do that, you will never become a great implantologist. And so you... Implantology is understanding tissue. You know, bone is also tissue. It's just a mineralized connective tissue. So you must read, smell, feel the bone. That's the first thing when you place an implant. You must feel the bone. That's what you have to do. You have to feel it. You have to see it. You have to smell it, I always say in my education. <laughs> then you understand what kind of tissue, mineralized tissue, you work with. In addition... Afterwards, you have to understand the mucosa around these implants very well. What do you have to create as a surgeon around those implants? This is completely underestimated worldwide. The soft tissue management in the functional area around an implant, in our opinion, Otto and my opinion, is one of the most demanding procedures ever. But also in the aesthetic zone, as we all know, is the soft tissue management around the implant very demand. So this really means you need to understand biology on a very high level. And so first you should learn perio. That's my, I'm convinced about that. And then you can move up, but it's, as you say, as you said, in two hours, believe me, you cannot understand implantology. This is impossible because it's not just placing a screw into the bone. This is what many, many do. And today you have the feeling, yeah, everything can be done navigated, you know. You place your template in the mouth, you fix it with some screw on the palatal side, and then you place your implants flapless and do nothing. This ends up in long term in disaster, 100%. In this kind of disaster I present here too in my article. So there you really need to understand what you do. And therefore this approach, which seems to be very simple using the digital dentistry today, and patient can go to the opera in the evening as it's advertised, forget it. This cannot be, this is not the future of implant, long lasting implant dentistry. Short lasting, yes, this works for three, four, maybe five years, and then you get into problems, and then you have to work on that very hard. And maybe you cannot solve them even. 
Sometimes. Yeah, but it's because I remember Danny Boozer and others saying the, uh, these things many years ago, like in the next year we will face uh, catastrophic uh, failures from around the world. Um, uh, and and uh, I don't see this happen. So uh, what, what's the reason that we don't see that many failures? No, is, is it that nobody shows the failures or is trying to hide them or... What's the reason? Because I remember, and I was really also afraid 20 years ago or 10 years ago, that a lot of uh, specialists or people like um, university professors were, were like predicting uh, a, a nightmare, a catast catastrophic uh, outcome of uh, implant dentistry becoming something that the general dentist is doing every day, like what you said, screwing, put, placing screws in the bone. But it, lo it, it seems that it works. So uh, there must well, be maybe a, you know, <laughs> it's like the amalgam fillings. So um, yeah, um, this is, you know, this has to do with communication. It's very simple to explain this, what you just said. I mean, you know, also in orthopedics, if you do a hip replacement, if it works 12, 15 years, they are happy, the patient, then they get a new one. And if you say as a dentist, now we are going to place an implant here, or we make five, four implants, an implant reconstruction, full rehabilitation, the upper jaw, it will last maybe 10, 12 years. This will work 100%. I get this feeling very often, patient comes in, and uh, they have eight, nine years. It looks disastrous. Perimplantitis everywhere. You have to take out all the implants. But believe me, those patients don't blame their patient, uh, their dentist or their surgeon who did the job. They say, oh, it was good. It lasted eight, ten years. It's great. <laughs> so this has a lot to do how we communicate and what is the, you know, what is the media? What are the medias doing? I mean, if we would say, okay, we know from the data we have certain patient group where we can say today, this implant will last, if you do it right, long lifetime. Like take an example. If the patient loses his teeth because of carriers, and you see this, the patient comes to you, totally carriers everywhere, but no bone loss, no bone loss at all. Even though he doesn't brush his teeth, he has no bone loss. This is a case, believe me, you place implant, you will be very successful because implants cannot get carriers. And so this is a typical case where you will be very successful, even though when you do it, not perfect. So it becomes more delicate when you have a patient with a periodontal history. This patient is also vulnerable for periodontitis. And in this patient, if you tell this patient, no problem, you will last, this will last a lifetime. You have real problems if you don't follow the guidelines we have today in implant dentistry. You have to be very careful there. You, there you have to offer the patient 100% and maintenance program. This is shown in the literature very well. You have to make your reconstruction the way that the patient can clean them 360 degree around it. If you don't do that, the patient will create periplatitis, which is shown. So there, the soft tissue management becomes crucial. If you have mucosa around this implant, which is mobile, the patient will become on a high incidence of prevalence periplantitis. And so <clears throat> there you run into this problem. Now when you tell this patient, yeah, maybe this will work 10 years. So that's fine. The patient is happy. He invests for 10 years and in 10 years he gets the next generation of new implants and new teeth and he's happy. So this is, I mean, I can tell you <clears throat> there are two things. One time, we just discussed is the functional area. The second is the, is the aesthetic outcome, the aesthetic catastrophe. But this is something we observe in our office much more today in comparison 10, 15 years ahead or ago. Today we have at least every week one case in the aesthetic zone where the patient comes to us and asks now for a solution. And believe me, most of them there's no way even we cannot solve those cases. It's disastrous. And I can show you cases where, you know, those patients, they cannot smile anymore. And 
to resolve them or to solve those cases is a nightmare for them. It's really a nightmare. So placing imp in the aesthetic zone is even at a higher level if the predictability of a long-term result. So there you should be even more careful because if you fail there over 10 years, you cannot solve this later on. If it's two or three implant aesthetic zone and you run into problems, nobody in the world can solve them till today on a perfect predictable way. So okay. yeah. be careful. So that's why I'm sending these cases to Ronnie Jung. Yeah, you're right. Send it to somebody, but even he cannot solve them. No, 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 no. I'm not. But no, my 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 thing is, or uh, uh, me as a general as a general practitioner, I'm placing implants. But I, as I told you, only where I see there's more than enough bone, no problem, mm -hmm. no issues. Then it's then it's like say then it's like doing the in the old days, like doing the amalgam filling. Yeah. But if it's if it's something more uh, sophisticated, so I can help a patient who tells me. I cannot chew anymore, so I can play. I take the, I do the comb beam. See that there's enough bone. There's no risk to uh, to to uh, touch the nerve or any other tissues, and then I place the implant. But I don't, I don't do any augmentation. I do the, I don't do any uh, of these procedures because I, I'm, I'm afraid of the failure. Maybe because I was, uh, I was uh, triggered too much in Switzerland by, by all the dental schools. It's yeah, like. Like in Switzerland, professor. Forever, forever. Everything is forever. You learn everything is forever, which is also <laughs> not true. Also, when you do intuitive work, it's not forever. You were trained like me with the comprehensive treatment concept. We thought that once you do something, it's forever. But this is not the truth. This is a wrong teaching. What was done for us? Even restoration will not last forever. You know that. No, no, we have changed the concept of, uh, I, I even have written an editorial on the controlled clinical failures so that you that you tell the patients, look, if you have a, something chipped, I will repair it with composite, uh, taking, taking the risk that it will fracture after one week or 10 years, we don't know. So, yeah. uh, but implants for me, it's all, it was always something that I'm uh, really, I have a high respect uh, of any surgical treatments. I like to take out wisdom teeth, but uh, this is something that I, I developed. Uh, it's some for you, you will laugh and it's something easy, but I'm more <laughs> restorative dentist and for, from time to time I do some, some small surgery, but I'm, I, I tell always my colleagues, I have high respect of uh, all these surgical treatments. But on the other hand, what we are doing is also important. So uh, <laughs> it's not it's an only implant dentistry. And I liked your, your uh, answer, where should we start when talking or when learning about implant dentistry that we should go back and start with peri periodontal treatment or understanding uh, uh, periodontal uh, diseases and um, yeah this is this was very very let's say very interesting so some other questions were related uh, on uh, gingival characteristics or uh, pre-existing soft tissue recession whatever so um, I think you have answered these questions that we have to analyze analyze the case the patient but are there are there some uh, guidelines? I, I know in the literature there are these these things like uh, biotype of the gingiva. Then there's the the let's say also the biotype of the bone. So I will I could imagine if we put these puzzle pieces together, there's like a re there could be a recipe. This is difficult. Say that there's no recipe. This is very difficult because you can you know you can do many things today, and depending on your skill and on your understanding there are as you said there are some people who recommend things in a thin biotype thin buccal bone you have to do a lot against the resorption against the recession the buccal side the first thing you have to do everybody knows this today to place the implant more to the palatal side so give more space for soft tissue and bone regeneration do you need the buccal bone there is Tarossa from Brazil who is doing reconstruction of the buccal bone right away in many cases on a very successful way as we have we had him in uh, Krakow you remember maybe in Krakow at the close meeting he has very very great cases 
but he always loses two in each case. So he combines autogenous bone reconstruction with connective tissue from the tuberositas. That's a tricky thing. He, he doesn't care about the about the biotype. He just do his concept. Uh, I would say if you have a thin biotype, you need to be more careful. You need to add for sure connective tissue plus some grafting material. You should have the buccal bone intact. But you know, as I said, Tarosa said, would smile at me now and say, forget it. I reconstruct this. You know, the, the weakness of his approach, of his concept is still that he has not yet any three-dimensional analysis over six, seven years published. He didn't publish anything about how this looks like over the years. I did a lot of cases like his concept. This works very predictable in my hands too. But honestly, you get the resorption, you get the little recession. So now it depends on the patient. We come back to this situation. If you have a 65 years old man, he doesn't want to spend in your office 10 times you take out the tooth, you wait, then you bend, then you place an implant, then you you have three, four surgery. He will say, forget it, doctor. Can you do it in one session? But maybe you will get a little bit recession. We get a little bit lost, but his lip line is down there. So what? That's perfect. You did it in one session. That's it. Finished. Case is finished. He's happy. Patient gets what he wants. The implant is functionally completely in bone. Aesthetically, it's not perfect. I agree. You lost a little bit of volume, but for this patient, perfect treatment. So, you know, you have to differentiate today a lot. What you have on your chair, what is the expectation of your patient? If it's a 25 years, or anyhow, a 25 years old lady, we would never place an implant in the aesthetic zone today. I can tell you that we place today in a in a, in the age of 35, we are starting to think about implants in the aesthetic zone. So I was very much surprised that uh, at the webinar we had, the last webinar, where I was the moderator of the series we had at the EAD with the AAD, I asked uh, Denis Tano about this issue. Is there still some concerns about the age of the patient? And the Americans, they have no concern. They follow the same rules as we followed 25 years ago. So 2022 20, depends, female, male, the same rules. For us in Europe, my understanding, we discussed this together also last close meeting in Mallorca at EAD. There is, this is a nightmare if you do that. This is made too early. You should postpone, postpone, should look for alternatives, place implant, not too much in the aesthetic zone. So this can be a big problem. And you know, even though people say it's only 25%. 25%, in my opinion, is a big number. It's a big number where you run into problems with further development of facial growing and so on. This is too much. I would not place in my daughter when she's 30, before 34, 45, an implant the aesthetic zone. I would look for alternatives for sure. So you see, it depends a lot on, as we discussed, sight and patient expectation and so on. This is what you have to take into consideration more and more today. So a uh, last question before we, before I let you go <laughs> to have a beer or whatever, <laughs> um, is uh, something that um, I know that you, in the next issue, there will be another article on uh, on your socket shield technique. Also other groups, Gluckman, and uh, have published in the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry about that. Just to close the discussion, because there were some questions also. What is uh, what? What? How do you see the role? Because you told me you don't you don't really care about the buccal bone, but uh, the socket shield is something to keep the buccal bone. So, uh, what? Maybe some uh, short short comments on uh, on the difference of don't care about the bone and care about the bone. I mean, I care a lot about the bone, don't misunderstand me, but I have to reconstruct it and there are options to reconstruct it on a predictable base today. So we need at the end some bone because I don't want to have exposed threads 
in on the buccal side. So I care about the bone and I'm but I'm able to reconstruct it. This is what Darosa clearly showed in because he showed CBCTs after three, four, and five years and shows always on the buccal side some kind of bone. If it's enough or not regarding the aesthetic outcome, that's a different story. But bone is there. Then we are that's important. But uh, yes, if you ask me about the soccer shield, soccer shield is a it's time for Otto and myself. We developed this technique 2007. We have now 30, 12, 30 years of experience. And we found now it's time, and that's why we submitted the paper to your journal, which we thank you, will be published next issue, where we come out with our protocol. The problem is that there is a lot of misunderstanding and we thought it's now time to publish our protocol because there are so many rumors and wrong, wrong uh, opinions about our technique. And they are published and people say, Herschel and Sue are doing this way, even though we never published it. We never published the protocol and now we thought it's time and you will be surprised, or many of you will be surprised to see that there are many, many other thoughts we have, which nobody are, nobody has published till today. There are new thought process you must have when you do this technique. And that's one thing, just as a teaser for you to read this article and also for you. I, I, I already have, I, I had to read it already. <laughs> is that the CBCT is absolutely mandatory. If you do a soccer shield case, you need to have a CBCT. And in this case, the CBTT is not only there to make the right position, to, to analyze the right position of the implant and to create the surgical guide. The CBCT has the function of the designing of the socket, of the sheet. This is a completely new thought process. And you have different options to design your sheet. And you will read this perfectly in this new article that you think about how you can lock the sheet. Also, this is never mentioned. So there are many new thoughts we always had, but we never published them. And we understand this technique much better today. There's no doubt. And it, we do it very successful today. And we had a learning curve. We learned a lot. We made a lot of mistakes at the beginning. And I see there is, there are cases where it really makes sense to use this technique, in our opinion, where you, at least you should discuss this option with your patient. Because this technique allows you a very predictable, perfect aesthetic outcome. This is unusual, specifically when you have to place or to replace two teeth beside each other in the aesthetic zone. There, I want to know from anybody in the world who has the predictable procedure to do to solve this problem. Predictable and 95%. This I would like to see if there's another concept. But if soccer cheese, you have an option. And if you have a lady, young lady, 35, 34, and she needs to implant beside each other aesthetic zone, at least you should discuss this option with the patient. So there is a lot of potential technique. But on the other side, I have to admit, there are many, many wrong, um, how do you say, wrong recommendations in the literature, wrong techniques, you know, which have nothing to do with our originally published soccer cheat technique. And there you end up with real problems. And we mentioned this, everything in this article, it's the summary of our 12 years experience, and it's really now, uh, step-by-step -step protocol, how we do this technique today. And we also offer now in our academy classes, master classes, where we discuss this over two days, how we do this technique today and why. There is a lot of... Well, yeah, <laughs> this is a nice, nice word uh, to, end, to end up our uh, discussion or our interview. Uh, I will, I will uh, discuss with Quintessence if we can uh, publish your article not only in the journal but also in the facebook group 
that uh, everybody can uh, learn from from you i think this would be an important information to share and if there will be for sure some discussions maybe you can uh, jump in and uh, answer some uh, some of the questions i'm sure there will be a lot of questions uh, related to this article and I'm sure that we can share this in the group and discuss this further because I think this is a very hot topic and very interesting topic. So once again, thank you, Mark, for taking your time and uh, let's keep in touch. And everybody who watched or will watch later, uh, we will continue with this series and uh, I'm looking forward to make this uh, a huge group with a lot of discussion. So I don't see the discussion at this time, but I'm sure the, the bigger the group will be and uh, people like you also dropping by from time to time to answer some questions that we can create something important related to the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry, the European Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry and everybody who has fun and is interested in uh, getting better in dentistry, not only aesthetic dentistry, that's why I'm always trying, let's share the passion for aesthetic but dentistry. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening. And to all who watched us, bye-bye uh, and see you soon. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.